Now it's time to flick into overdrive. Welcome to episode two of Overdrive. And today we're going to look at two cars that we think are pretty exciting. Well, I think a Citroen DS is very exciting. And Jeremy thinks that a Jaguar Mark II is very exciting. Indeed, I think the Jaguar Mark II is really quite a, a unique car amongst classic cars. And we'll be showing you an in-depth review of a standard car and a modified car. As well as that, we're going to have a look at those motorbikes we told you about in episode one. We're going to have a look at some British beauty and hopefully we're going to have some fun along the way. So, flick the switch. Today we're very fortunate to have a standard Mark II Jaguar in the shop, together with my Coombs replica that I've been working on for some time. So it's a good way of showing you the little differences in the cars. Um, we've got the bonnet open here on a 3.4 litre. As you can see, it's just got the standard air cleaner on it, on top of the wonderful XK engine with its twin overhead cams and a plain bonnet. But over here, we have the louvered bonnet for extra cooling on the car. Um, we don't have any air cleaner at all. We've got bigger carburettors, open mouth trumpets on the carburettors, and a really quite highly tuned 4.2 litre version of the engine. Makes for a very exciting car. So just gonna drop the bonnets now, and we can take one of the cars out for a drive. Well, the Citroen DS is a remarkably interesting car, and it just so happens it's the 60th birthday of the DS. It was launched in 1955 to huge acclaim, and has always been an icon of motoring, and has been, you know, in those surveys that they do, oft described as the most beautiful car in the world. And it's been much photographed, much talked about, but not just by motoring press, but by artists, and philosophers. For instance, Helmut Newton, that fantastic photographer from the late 20th century, took some rather nice shots of Citroen DSs with his beautiful models in. And Roland Barthes, I can't quite remember his dates, he died in the 1980s or something like that, had this to say about the Citroen DS. French philosopher, not many cars get written about in this mode. Here's what uh, Roland, had to say in 1957, just a couple of years after it was launched. I think that cars today are almost the exact equivalent of the great Gothic cathedrals. I mean the supreme creation of an era conceived with passion by unknown artists and consumed in image, if not in usage, by a whole population which appropriates them as a purely magical object. It is obvious that the new Citroen has fallen from the sky in as much as it appears at first sight as a superlative object. Lofty praise indeed. Lofty praise. Of course the DS is a French play on words meaning the goddess. DS. So we don't, you know, in English we could go DS mate. DS means goddess. There's only one other car I can think of that has such a good play on words but doesn't quite work for me. It's the Alfa Romeo Mito which means myth in Italian but it also it was part built in Milan, Milano, M-I, and part built in Turin, Torino, T-O. So they put the two together. But you can't really call the Al Alfa Romeo Mito a myth in the same way that the goddess is. It's a great car, wonderful shape, and they made hundreds and hundreds, millions of them in a 20-year period. First launched in 1955, and when they were first launched, they hung it suspended from the ceiling without any wheels on it to make to give this idea of this spaceship futuristic shape which it very much was for 55 
The car we're going to look at is one of the last, made in 1975, 20 years on. But a fabulous, fabulous motor car. I'll just finish, as we're looking at the DS, with a couple more quotations from, uh, from uh, Roland Barthes, this well-known French philosopher. The object here is totally prostituted, appropriated, originating from the heaven of metropolis. The goddess is in a quarter of an hour mediatized, actualizing through this exorcism the very essence of petty bourgeois advancement. And of course, I am petty bourgeois, and that's why the city, we're honoring the Citroen DS's 60th birthday. But enough of the DS, Jeremy. Now, I can't think, other than having four wheels, of a similarity between the Citroen DS and the Mark II Jaguar. After listening to that, uh, that uh, wonderful presentation you've just given us, um, the Mark II Jaguar seems terribly ordinary compared to that, but I think it's a wonderful car because I can't think of another saloon car that uh, so many people identify with that has this sort of Englishness with the walnut and the leather, uh, the wonderful Jaguar XK engine which won Le Mans in the C and D type, but was also a real pedigree racing car. In fact, it was a uh, uh, so hot on the tracks of the early 1960s that uh, if you look at all of the wins at the great racing circuits in the UK, you'll find that it was all Mark II Jaguars. If the uh, Citroen DS was the car of the uh, petty bourgeois, as uh, Roland Barthes describes it, who drove uh, Jaguar Mark II? Well, that's interesting because I think it, it appealed to, you know, there's obviously the, uh, 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 the thing that people say about bank robbers driving them. Diamond the, geezers. The police force having to get them because, you know, they, the, they couldn't catch the bank robbers in the cars, the Wolseleys or whatever they had at the time. But I think really for mums and dads as well, you know, families, one of my earliest motoring memories is going with my father and my mother and my sister down to Brighton in the back of a Mark II Jaguar. And it, it's just something that was part of the landscape of certainly Britain in the 1960s. And I think those two cars that we're going to be looking at in more detail are both very much um, sort of institutions. As you say, the Jaguar Mark II mm -hmm. is peculiarly British, the Citroen DS is peculiarly French, but both very popular cars and used for an inordinate amount of different things, police cars. Talking of police cars, um, we're going to look at the, um, I was at the Dubai Motor Show uh, just recently. They've got police cars there because everybody's got such fast cars. They've got Bentleys, Porsches, BMWs. You should see the police cars that they've got. A bit better than the Jaguar Mark II, if I may say so. Yes, I think they're right. The Jaguar Mark II, particularly in 3.8 litre form, which was the largest engine you could get in the car, was the fastest four-door saloon car in the world at the time. It could certainly do 125, if not 128 miles an hour with the manual overdrive gearbox. It was really the BMW M5 of its day, a compact, high-performance saloon car that had a Le Mans winning engine in it, five gears effectively with the four speed and overdrive. Overdrive, it's time to flick the switch. Good mention, plug. Limited slip differential and four wheel disc brakes, all standard. And of course you could get it with wire wheels, either chrome or painted in the day. Chrome was for show and paint was for go. And it made a really unique package on the road. You quite like them, don't you? I love them. And I love the Citroen DS. You know, they're so stylish, uh, you know, not so brutal aerodynamic shape, whereas the, the Jag is much more powerful, isn't it? It's, it's uh, as Bart said, the mythology of bestiary. But we could go on arguing about the merits of your favourite car and my favourite car for a long time. There's only one man who can settle this, the Baron. He's right behind us. Move it. Move it. We're beginning to gain on him. Okay, so we're talking about the Mark II Jag as being particularly British car, cops and robbers, 
the Sweeney, all that sort of gear, Arthur Daly. It's a great car, I agree with you, but it's not exactly beautiful. Tell me about some beautiful British cars and how do they become beautiful, Jeremy? Well, of course, one that uh, we're very closely associated with these days and still with the Bond franchise going is the Aston Martin range, certainly DB4, 5 and 6 are probably pinnacles of British beauty in GT form, but they're not really British, are they? Well, no, well, they are, they, I mean, Aston Martin, but the bodywork, of course, was designed by a touring Superleggera, um, which is one of the great uh, Italian carrozzeria. So it's a, a combination of the two, I suppose, the British Britishness and the Italian style and flair maybe British engineering in a fine Italian suit. I like the sound of that. What sort of electrics did it have? British? British. Probably just as well. <laughs> but beautiful, beautiful cars to look at. And I uh, hope you like the Aston Martin DB4 and DB6 we have to show you. We haven't got a DB5. There's always a spectre hanging over us, but never mind. And we're going to be talking a bit about uh, British motorcycles, particularly Triumphs, and another favourite of mine, the Triumph Bonneville. I always love the sound of that parallel twin. And we've got a rather special uh, high-performance version, a T120 TT that was built for the American market for flat track racing. And we're going to compare it to a standard road-going T120 as well. Here we have three classic Triumph Bonnevilles. Two 1966 T120 TT competition machines and a 1970 T120R, R for road going, which is considered to be the best road going model of the classic Triumph Bonneville. But the T120 TTs are really interesting. They only made a few hundred of them. They were built for desert racing and flat track racing in America. They have high compression engines, 11 to 1 compression. They have more aggressive cams, so more performance, but they're terribly lightweight. Everything's been stripped off them. As you look at the road-going bike, you can see that it's got silencers, a speedometer, various other bits and pieces, lights, etc., on the bike, which all add weight. But these stripped-down TTs um, are very lightweight, more performance, and a lot of fun to ride. And I noticed, James, you're wearing a pair of Steve McQueen limited edition glasses. Well, I thought I should because um, this is the bike that Steve McQueen rode, wasn't it? One very similar to this. That's right, he favoured the model. Um, and they're pretty, you, you can see why the King of Cool would have liked it because they're rather cool motorbikes. They've got um, stickers on the tank saying World Motorcycle Speed Record Holder. Tell us a bit about that, Jeremy, please. Well, that was a, 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 an award that Triumph won, and of course they used it in their marketing. So it's not actually this particular bike, um, but it's something that, that they achieved and then they used it in their market. But these bikes were pretty quick though. They were, yes. Um, I think uh, these machines would do well over 120 miles an hour, maybe 126 or something like that, and would dip into just into 13 second quarter miles. So they were a good performance machine. And yours has been, I mean, mine is as McQueen would have ridden one across. Naked. Yes, um, but yours has been slightly roadified. It's got a headlight and a few bits put on it, so that's legal to ride on the road, but this one isn't. That's right, yes. This, car, this bike was registered in California, and, and as you rightly say, has lights on it and, and for road use. But uh, the machine you're sitting on is just completely standard competition spec. Yeah, well, um, I don't fancy doing 120 mile an hour across the desert flats in this, um, but uh, I quite like sitting on it just while it's not going anywhere, because it's a real, just a nice piece, of, nice thing, isn't it? Yeah, they're beautiful machines. They're, they're beautifully balanced in their styling and nice things to have around. Lovely. Since episode one, Jeremy, we've done a huge amount of traveling, haven't we? You have been at You've the- You've done rather more than me, but uh, I've been at the Goodwood Revival. I make a pilgrimage to go there every year. And I've got to say, I think it's the finest classic car event in the world. We were then at the All British Car Day at Parramatta, not quite so uh, far from home for us. But fun, it's like a big garden party, a beautiful surroundings of the, the old school there, and a fantastic turnout. I reckon that every single frog eye sprite that's in Australia was there. Yes, I like those. Uh, my brother-in-law used to have one of those, I remember that very fondly. Um, then I was in Shanghai for the Bund Classic, which was great fun, and I drank a lot of Tattinger, which was rather nice. Uh, then we were both in Melbourne for Motoclassica, 
We had the big auction and uh, that went well. Uh, actually the largest ever classic car auction to be held outside of um, the United States or Europe. So we were pretty pleased with that, with the results of that. Still only a small blip on the, uh, on the world scale, but we're getting bigger and uh, people are starting to take notice of us. So that was pretty exciting. And then um, I say, as I said earlier, I was at the uh, Dubai International Motor Show where they had a pop-up motor museum, a uh, classic motor museum, which was really rather fun. Um, yes. Next issue, episode of Overdrive, we're going to talk about the BMW 100th birthday in 2016. We were hoping to show you a very nice BMW that Jeremy had here in the showroom, but you sold it. Gone to a new home. Gone to a new home. And um, we might even push out and do something on the water. What do you think? If the sun ever shines here in Australia again, um, we might go on the water. Get some boats out. Get some old boats out as well as old cars. I don't know what the equivalent of overdrive in a boat is, but I'm sure it's got something. Um, so, until the next episode, thank you very much. It's time to say goodbye. Don't forget to flick the switch to... In, into overdrive for our next episode. I just wanted to show you this car quickly. Uh, it's a car that I sold for four or five years ago, and it's just in for some work. But it's a 1966 Mercedes-Benz 230SL, commonly known as the Pagoda. The interesting thing about this car is it's terribly original. Most of these cars that you see have been restored or repaired in some way. But this has done 78,000 miles, has all its original interior, original paintwork, and I'm going to show you one or two little features on the car that you should look out for if you want to find a really great one. Where the headlamp bezel fits onto the front wing here, there's a little, uh, little relief on it. Now, when they were making these cars and leading up this area so it fitted the bezel, so the wing fitted the bezel, they put a little file mark in the lead on the side. Now that's often missing or when people restore these cars they make a big styling feature of it and it looks all wrong and it's very unusual to see a car that's got it just how they did it at the factory, just a little file nick in the lead and then painted it and that should line up with the relief on the bezel. One of the other things with these pagodas, you've got this removable hard top and the soft top is stowed underneath the tonneau panel here at the back. When they were new, everything fitted perfectly. You could take your hard top off, put it on the stand, put your soft top up and the windows would seal perfectly with e either roof up. When these cars have been restored, they've lost their original hard top, something like that's happened to them. Often the case where the windows only line up with one roof, predominantly the soft roof, because that's what most people have the, on the cars. But you can see on this car that everything just lines up and shuts beautifully. 